Hello, welcome. Thank you for coming. This is a very exciting one for me. I'm very happy to be here tonight. I'm Michael Shaban. Among other things, I'm the chairman of the board of the McDowell Colony. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is the third year that we have done this particular kind of event in this particular form. And um, if you've been to the two previous ones, you've probably heard me say something like this before. But the idea behind this event was to try to approximate in some way one of the things that I think is not only the um, most positive, most fun, most uh, uh, memorable parts of a residency at the McDowell Colony, but often really one of the most productive parts for the individual artists who take place in it, and that is talking, the conversation, uh, particularly at the dinner table, uh, at meals, in the morning, breakfast, if you make it to the breakfast table, I don't usually manage um, to do that, but uh, at, at, you get artists um, sitting around talking, and a lot of the time, out of those conversations, which can take place over the course of several evenings um, or weeks even, projects arise, uh, breakthroughs arise. Uh, people who, um, well, and, and, and the, th the thing that's so wonderful about it is that you have artists who are in different disciplines. And so you have a painter sitting next to a composer and there's a writer and um, a choreographer. And so people who seemingly are coming from very different places find themselves together talking about the problems they're facing in their own work, and it often ends up helping people working in other disciplines. So I've tried in past events uh, and tonight as well to, to reach out to um, two artists who uh, work in different disciplines. And so we have uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda here. Fresh from his uh, Grammy nomination today for the soundtrack. You too! Oh. You got one too. You got a Grammy nomination today too. Yeah. <clears throat> you're looking more fresh though. I, you're more fresh than I am. Um, uh, for Hamilton soundtrack, congratulations on that. And then um, as if I needed to introduce Martin Scorsese. <laughs> the director of Many, 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 many wonderful films, and also a great champion and hero of, of um, American cinema, world cinema, preservation, um, um, and just a kind of a, a, of a great evangelist for the art of cinema. So thank you both for being here, and, um, and you are both um, in the middle of things right now. And I thought, I mean, that's sort of how conversations often start at McDowell with um, people saying, what are you working on? What are you doing? Why are you here? So I don't know. I mean, we know you're, you're appearing on stage every night. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know that. And that's the performing side of you. But so what about the creative side of you? Where is the creative side of, of Lin-Manuel Miranda right First now? of all, I have to tell you, I drank so much coffee just to be able to keep up with the two of you tonight. And I'm really <laughs> um, thrilled to be here. Um, well, I was drinking coffee to keep up with you. <laughs> oh, this is going to go very quickly. <laughs> um, just <a> one cup. <laughs> 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 Damn. <laughs> um, no, we were both. You're the gold standard. Yeah, you're the gold standard. We're both yeah. trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the show um, seven times a week, and that is weirdly become the most relaxing part of my day, um, <laughs> because the only thing I'm supposed to be doing in that moment is being Alexander Hamilton, um, and I'm not supposed to be doing other things while I do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of my life, you know, I have, I have a one-year-old child. I'm writing songs for an animated musical for Disney right now um, that'll open a year from now. Can it you opens tell things. us? What yeah, that it's is called uh, Moana. Um, and it's set in the Pacific Islands, um, and it's kind of this incredible premise, which is true, um, which was that the Pacific Islanders had their own system of navigation that didn't use maps and compasses, and they navigated from Bora Bora and Tahiti all the way around to Hawaii, all the way around to the Philippines in this incredible circle, using dead reckoning, using the stars, using the tides. For a thousand years they did that before Westerners ever came over, and then it just sort of stopped, hmm. and no one really knows why, and so it's sort of this fictional... Um, uh. Disney version of why they how they start back up again and there are demigods and there are undersea creatures and Dwayne the Rock Johnson plays a demigod named Maui. Oh Maui. So I get yeah. to write a song for the rock. Wow, that's cool. Um, There's which a is childhood adorable. dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> so um, which is really fun to get to write for a persona like that. So, so when I'm, do you I'm, do that? When do you work? I write um, 
I meet with them via teleconference every Tuesday and Thursday before my show. Um, so I'll go home and write for a little while. And, um, and yeah, and we just kind of send sessions back and forth. But I, I'm usually writing between shows on Wednesday. Um, that's, that's my key writing <laughs> time. <laughs> um, and then I collapse in a heap at the end of the night. <laughs> wow. And what about you, Marty? You want to tell us what you've been um, doing? Is it mic? Is that mic? On? Is it on? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Uh, Moana is uh, is the name of uh, Robert Flaherty's the documentary Moana with the Moana of the South Seas I think is it really yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. that yeah I think it was, yeah it was a silent one I believe yeah is that the Nanook of the North guy that's no. the Nanook of the North fella yeah yeah, yeah. which was interesting because he uh, not maybe people I guess know it anymore but uh, Nanook of the North was the, the, considered the first documentary I forget the year 1915 1920 mm -hmm. Um, and um, he went up there, and he, you know, was with the Inuit and did everything with them, and igloos building, killing seals, all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> he was an extraordinary master. And when he came back, he was working on the film, and he was smoking, and it was nitrate film, and it blew up. Oh. So he had to go back. <laughs> <laughs> to go back, he had to explain to Nanook. <laughs> He said, what are you back for? Well, we're going to build the igloo again, again. Oh, my These, these people are great. All right, I'll do it. Oh. It was, it's reconstructed. It's, re it's reconstructed. Wow. In the very first documentary, there. And it, it was, was gone. a fraud. It was that damn nitrate, and he was smoking, and he oh. lost all the scenes. Anyway, so what was your question? Oh. <laughs> what are you uh, working on? What, yeah, what are you, what are you working um, on? A couple of things. I'm, I'm um, editing with uh, my editor, Thelma Schoonmaker. We're editing um, a film called Silence based on a book by Shashiko Endo. Mm -hmm. Endo is a, a Japanese author. Um, this book was written in the early 60s. And um, uh, it was shot in Taipei this year, uh, doubling for Kyushu province, south of Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know, we spent about five or six months there. Uh, this is something you've wanted to do for a long time. Yeah, right? I, I, since... Um, I had finished Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, the wow. bishop, our Archbishop uh, Paul Moore gave me this book, Silence, and it's about faith. Uh -huh. um, that, was he giving it to you sort of like as a corrective or like? like no, actually. Or he was okay actually, with the Last Temptation? He was okay. He, yeah. he, was, he was all right. He, he pointed out. He, he really got it. He hmm. really did. And then I uh, said, uh, you should read this other book. And so I did. And I took it. I was going to Japan and uh, for some other reason. I took the book with me and read it there. And... Um, it stayed with me for many years. We got the. It's taken. Uh, it took maybe fifteen years to come around to uh, understanding, or at least attempting to understand, the nature of the story and mm -hmm. um, uh, the issues involved. Um, and that means that it took a very, very long time for us to pull a script together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, also, wasn't the, the the subject matter wasn't one that I found uh, uh, studios and. Uh, really? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. I, I just Four monks in feudal yes, Japan. No, no, they just didn't respond. I, <laughs> and so it took a few years, mm -hmm. um, and we worked it on a certain. But in, in, in any event, it, it uh, it's taken a while. We're in the middle. We're in the middle of assembling a first cut. Uh -huh. um, Are you uh, working with uh, Thelma? Thelma? Yes. Uh, at the same time, I've done a um, uh, a pilot. Actually, it's a film. It's about, it's a little under two hours. Um, shot it last summer. And we just finished the mixing last week, actually, um, for a television series for HBO called Vinyl, uh, which is about the music business in the 1970s uh, in New York, based in New York. Well, that's the one with Bobby Cannavale. Bobby Cannavale yeah. and uh, uh, Olivia Wilde and Juno Temple and... Uh, um, oh, wow. Julian yeah, yeah, Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, Whoa. Yes, very interesting. <laughs> I remember uh, Bo Deedle. Uh, <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, it, 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 there are about 10 episodes, and those episodes are being completed now, and I, I, I just directed the pilot. Uh -huh. But that's going to open, I, that's going to start, I think, around February 14th. Is that 15th. a world that you, that when, when it was going on in the early 70s, were you, did you have any connection to it? Did you know people in the music business? Well, that, that music, that music was a very, very much a part of my whole life. Mm -hmm. And so um, in New York... Um, I got to know them really around 1976 when I was doing The Last Waltz. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, uh, and Mick Jagger was the one who came to me about 20 years ago um, or 18 years ago to, to said, let's make a feature about the music business because it's really about the business. 
um, uh, how the executives behave, uh, the, the nature of how the artists are treated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's very fast and crazy and, and uh, wild. But um, uh, yeah, so over the years, we tried to make it into a feature, but I didn't know where to stop. Mm -hmm. So you get I don't know where to stop. Plenty of story. And, and then uh, I got involved with Terry Winter, uh, Terry Winter on uh, Wolf of Wall Street and also on Boardwalk Empire, and he suggested making it a series, and so uh, we started. So now music, I mean, you, you, you already mentioned this, but um, one of the things I wanted to ask both of you guys about is uh, the way that music, um, I mean, obviously you're writing music, that's part of what you do, but um, the way that there, this, there seems that both of you seem to have a kind of deep personal sort of biographical connection to music that you're then sort of trying to, you use that as a tool to help you tell the stories that you're going to tell or, or uh, uh, that shapes your notion. Like, I mean, it was kind of a crazy idea to think of doing the story of Alexander Hamilton in a hip hop right. mode. Well, well, it's interesting. I, you know, I think the original title for the show was the Hamilton mixtape and that's that's actually the most autobiographical part of it, uh -huh. because that's how I approach writing a score. It's, I'm making you a mixtape, and this is to show you how much I like you and how much I love you. Mm -hmm. The way we used to, mm -hmm. the way I used to make 90 minute ca Max L cassettes mm -hmm. for girls in mm -hmm. high school. And, um, but it's, it's so the great. same process. I mean, I, I worked really hard on those mixes, and it's the same process of building a score. You're gonna rise, and you're gonna fall, and you're gonna slow it down, and you're gonna speed it up, and, and all of the lyrics have secret meanings to you that you are trying to transmit to the person mm -hmm. you are giving it to. And, um, but but I, I believe that the music of your teenage years is always gonna be the most important to you for the rest of your life. Like, I am cal like, I love listening to new music and I'm always trying to listen to new music, but I'm calcified in early 90s hip hop. That was where I figured out who I was. Mm -hmm. And um, when I read Hamilton's book and realized, I, you know, I knew what everyone else knows. Um, he's, a, he's on the 10 and he died in a duel. Um, mm -hmm. But when I realized he, he really wrote his way into every circumstance and wrote his way to power and then also blew up his life through his writing, mm -hmm. the Reynolds pamphlet, the Adams pamphlet, um, it, it felt like a singularly, a story only hip hop could tell. Uh -huh. um, and so a lot of the references, at, you know, the music references in the show are really to that era. I mean, just the way, you know, you make such personal musical choices in your movies and they're really connected to what you grew up with. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of Biggie references in the show. There's a lot of, there's Camelot references because my mother who was sitting in the front mm -hmm. row blasted Camelot in our car. <laughs> so, so the Marquis de Lafayette says c'est moi, but because that's, that's our Camelot reference uh -huh. in the show. Um, so it's, it's me pulling everything I have um, and making you a mixtape. It's two hours and 45 minutes. It wouldn't fit on a Max L, but that's how I approach it. Mm -hmm. and, and do you see, is there kind of a kinship there? Can you, when you hear what let, when well, the mouth I, 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 I think you really nailed it by saying, by saying that the, we're, we're calcified that way in the, the music period that uh, was, well, in our for formative years, for me, it was late 1940s through the early 50s. In a way, well, my family working class, they did, they, they, there was no habit of reading in the house. So uh, it was really music. And the music was on, were on 78s and it had a lot of swing and some jazz, but um, popular music at the time, uh, the American songbook, as they say. Mm -hmm. uh, but the key music for me was the sound of uh, string instruments and uh, Django Reinhardt and the Hot Club of France. Mm. And as a child, I'd, I'd play these over and over, and I, it was also, I was always stuck in the house because of uh, asthma. I was not allowed to go out or do, you know. So I was in the house, play these records over, and I always thought it was one instrument, and all these images would come to mind. And so that stayed with me over the years. And I'm, um, I'm, I've, I've become, um, I became, partial to guitars and any kind of string instrument from, from whether it's uh, uh, Andre Segoya to Ravi Shankar. Mm -hmm. The first time I heard that uh, sitar in uh, uh, Pate Panchali, it was stunning. Yeah. The music cues are still in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, she, I, there's one, I was, on the, I was on TCM the other night and they wake up Apu and she says, come on, wake up. And he's, he has a blanket over him and you hear the, you hear the sitar beginning, beginning, and then she opens up a little hole and you see his eye there, and then it eye opens and bang. <laughs> so, oh, who are these guys? Where do I get this music? 
and I found it in Sam Goody's on 49th Street. <laughs> I did, oh, man. Goody's. I did. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so I was bringing all this music into this like two and a half room apartment with my parents, you know. And, um, uh, and then it was rock and roll, of course. Mm. Uh, the rock and roll change from in 1953, whether it was from the rhythm and blues Ruth Brown, which we do in um, uh, this uh, uh, pilot, this TV show, which. Um, what I tried to do again, like, uh, he's a music exec and he's going through a crisis and it's the music he hears in his head. Mm. So sometimes we just stop and we do the songs. Uh, whether it's Chris Kenner, I like it like that, or uh, uh, Mama, He Treats Your Daughter Mean. You just uh, play Ruth the Brown. whole record? Oh yeah, and have somebody doing it somehow, like mm. the spirit of the, Bo Diddley, uh, um, uh, like the spirit of, of the music is there, you know? And that's the narrative. And when you're shooting, typically, especially in like one of your films, where you where they're structured so much around a sequence of songs, a lot of rock and roll or pop songs that kind of fade one into the next or segueing the next. Are you thinking in those terms as you're writing a script or structuring? No, for them? the most part, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're written into the script the... usually. Written into the script. Uh, the Mascagni music in Raging Bull that was uh, was something that we knew we were going to use. I didn't realize we we're going to use it for the opening titles though, mm -hmm. uh, which became kind of a happy accident. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of it was. Uh, 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 intermezzos and other sections of operas that he that he had written, uh, Lemico Fritz and when, others. When you talked about the Pacha Panchali, the, the opening that that's like that's how I felt when I saw Mean Streets for the first time. Is it Be My Baby? Is that the Be My? Oh yes. And oh, that's, like I felt like I didn't yeah, understand that song until I saw the like yeah. you know when it was used and I thought like, okay I get the where this Spectre is coming sound. from. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah. Yeah, there was there was no other way to I you know I, I loved movies so much or cinema I should say at that point too because it was foreign films too, and uh, the thing about it was the uh, how would you get a composer? Why would you? It, in other words, that was another world. It was all gone, mm -hmm. or I, I didn't think it was gone. I hoped it hadn't been, but um, it, it was, and therefore you had to make your own scores, mm -hmm. you know, and so we started with Main Street. Yeah. yeah. So Lynn, y you um, you're a New York kid. Uh, you're from an immigrant background, Catholic background, growing up in New York City. This guy is making movies, coming from the same background in some ways, uh, immigrant family, Catholic background, streets of New York. Did you, was, did you? Yeah, it, it's so interesting that, that you brought up Last Temptation of Christ, because I remember when that movie came out, I was, I'm sorry to make you feel old. I was seven. Um, Come on. I, but I remember my, my, my hyper, hyper Catholic grandmother, so Catholic that we would pretend to stay asleep because if you were up at the same time, she'd take you to the 6.30 a.m. mass. <laughs> so we'd pretend to be asleep until she left for the 6.30 a.m. mass. Um, Did and, you know that, Luce? But I remember... Um, seeing the whole sort of hoopla around it, and I, w I think I was staying with my grandparents um, that summer, um, but then seeing the movie and loving the movie, and kind of, you know, I'd grown up with sort of the, the dogma and the, and the Sunday school and catechism of the Catholic Church, um, and that, that movie led me to really one of the more formative classes in my life, which was at Wesleyan, I took a class called uh, The Gospels and Christianity, um, and there's a direct Please. line between this uh -oh. and, and Hamilton, because That's great. it was an incredible, um, it's just incredible if you grow up Catholic to realize that the Bible was edited. That there were mm -hmm. a ton of stories that were written around that time, mm -hmm. and then some of them made it into the Bible centuries later, and some of them didn't. And this class focused on, you know, stories from the Dead Sea Scrolls and stories of that era that didn't make the Bible. There's a Gospel of Mary that are basically like Superboy stories about Jesus. He like <laughs> knocks a kid off the roof and brings him back to life. He like brings a pigeon back to life. <laughs> Yeah, the bird flies, he knocks him out, and he goes, oh, I feel bad, he brings him back. Like, it's Jesus <laughs> grappling with his powers as a kid. Wow. Um, and the notion of, oh, whoever <laughs> decided what stories got into the Bible helped create what we all learned as kids, uh -huh. that's, there's a direct line between that and who lives, who dies, who tells your story mm -hmm. in Hamilton. Um, the notion of the person telling the story is just as important as what actually happened and actually shapes what happened? Um, that's that. That was a big uh, influence, and it and it stems from Last Temptation of Christ all the way to that class, all the way to sort of opening up history for me. Wow, it's amazing. I mean, I you know, uh, I I was very serious about making that film. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect the the uh, the reaction on that level, mm -hmm. um, and um, 
But just and the notion yeah. that asking what if because it didn't happen. No, it's I know. What if? It's, it's what if I'd gotten married? One moment of yeah. uh, one moment because it's in, in Christologically spe speaking, it's all divine and all human. Yeah, all in the same the same uh, being, so to speak. Absolutely. Therefore, it has to deal with um, the temptations of the humanity, yeah. uh, and the temptation ultimately was to lead a normal life. So imagine it's very beautiful, like a gift. You see, when you were when you were getting flack at that time and controversy, if we could have just time traveled back and said, you know amazing. what, there's a kid out there. <laughs> no, no, amazing. <laughs> I, I, that's amazing. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. No. So, um, Catholic I, background you were getting to? Oh well, I, 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 I mean, do you? Was that, were you? I mean, it's pretty clear Catholicism played a strong role, and you, in fact, you, do you consider? Uh, entering the priesthood? Itself? Yes, I did yeah. for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was because there was uh, um, uh, the area I grew up in was very, um, uh, it's almost like a small Sicilian village. Well, we're sitting in it. Yes, mm -hmm. it was a block away actually, yeah. like around the Mons. corner on Elizabeth Street yeah. between Houston and Prince and Spring and that whole area. And it was very much Sicilian. On, on Mulberry Street was more Neapolitan, um, and the Sicilian had its own way. Uh, and and um, uh, it was just a very uh, tough time, 1949, 50, all the way to 57. And uh, the one, there was one young priest who was, uh, made a big difference in my life. He was about 23 years old. Um, and he was uh, a, new, uh, a new type of priest at that time. Uh, prior to that, the priests were very nice, but they were administering to the older generations of Sicilians. When I mean older generations, they were my grandparents and other people. And so I grew up with a lot of them. And there's this Norman Lewis, for example, has written these books on Sicily, one called The Honored Society, um, and in which he describes uh, the mindset of the Sicilians uh, in, the, in, in, in Sicily. And this is the mindset I grew up with a great deal. It, it, it described at one point as, uh, as Bedouin in double-breasted suits. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the idea of being out there in the landscape and looking for their sheep and then somebody's missing and there's this blood revenge constantly, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a thing of, um, of uh, never enough to go around and this ancient, ancient war that they don't know how it started, but they continue doing it. It's almost like, a, uh, he describes it as a population control. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And you don't know who did what to whom, but you're going to kill them. Mm -hmm. You know, and this was the mindset here. In America, it was the great tension because it was also this place called America. Five blocks over, or two blocks this way, you know. So um, this one priest, uh, it, it changed all that for us. He looked at myself and a couple of friends of mine. He said, you don't have to live like this. Hmm. Take advantage. And was he himself of Sicilian background? or, or? No, Italian-American, but not Sicilian. And um, he's still alive now. Huh. Not well, but he's... He's around it, and uh, he just uh, taught us a great deal. Uh, we would hear classical music a lot, but he had us buy the records, uh -huh. the LPs. We uh, give it, uh, gave us books, everything from Graham Greene to Dwight McDonald. Wow. You know, remember was of a revolutionist. Uh, uh, we brought in James Joyce, and he got a little upset with that. But <laughs> 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 Still. You know, um, uh, but he was uh, a an, an great lover of cinema and that sort of thing. And so um, he wow. was the one. And so I, 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 for the wrong reasons, I think, wanted to follow in to that. be like him. Yeah. And I, I, I learned right away I couldn't. Uh -huh. uh, the, the vocation is something that's really special. You can't, you know. Uh, and so um, uh, it found its way into uh, filmmaking, mm -hmm. really. In what way? Like, um, I think the, the 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 zealousness I had for uh, uh, the the priesthood or for a, a clerical life, so uh -huh. to speak, uh, um, found its way into um, cinema because that was the only real form of um, besides music. And I couldn't play music. My brother played guitar. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't write music. I couldn't play it. I tried um, telling stories and pictures made the difference. And these extraordinary emotional experiences that I had with my father or my mother, particularly my father seeing these films, everything from you know, Rear Window to Sunset Boulevard to uh, going through these experiences. He was a guy sometimes who didn't really talk about his feelings. So um, we experienced this together. And this was the way to tell the stories. But the stories I wanted to tell um, were the ones I heard around the table or I heard in the streets. Mm -hmm. And they, at that time, it was the 50s. Mm -hmm. And so by the mid-60s, by the early 60s, after John Cassavetes did Shadows and Shirley Clark did uh, The Cool World mm -hmm. and The Connection. You could do you it. Know. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then so you, in a way you're sort of hijacking this uh, long established um, medium that has strong tradition, but you're sort of, uh, you're, you're hijacking it to, to tell the kind of stories that it's not really telling at the time you start telling That's them. That's right, because and they would say at the table, they couldn't make a film like that. Not sure myself. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like what you're doing with the musical, don't you think? Yeah. Kind of, especially more in the, in the Heights in particular. Where yeah, I, I think that we have that in common, that I, I come from a deep love of musical theater. Like, I don't set out to, like, I set out to make a big old-fashioned musical every time mm -hmm. I do it. Mm -hmm. This is just the way it comes out uh -huh. um, when I do it. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's, I'm, you know, there are just as many references to Richard Rodgers as there are to Biggie in the score. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, um, um, but, but I, I grew up loving musicals, and it's that same thing of, um, I remember cast albums were, that was the thing. Mm -hmm. And my parents would weep Mm -hmm. At cast albums, and I would say, look at the way these songs make my parents cry. Like to see, to see your parents affected. I think by the thing, the sa same way you're describing with your father in film. It was, uh, it was cast albums. It was Camelot. It was, uh, it was Les Mis. Les Mis was the first show I ever saw, and I don't remember much of it because I was very little. But I remember my parents weeping to bring him home, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's that was the formative uh, thing for me as well. The, the theater, though, we, we they really couldn't afford the theater. Uh -huh. So there was cast albums. Cast albums, right. same. It was amazing. As I said, West Side Story, uh, I, I knew it uh, verbatim, basically, by heart, uh, from the album. And the Carol and um, Carol Lawrence and uh, Larry Curry. Can we talk about New York, New York a little bit? Well, that was my idea of a musical. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> it's a, I mean, I think it's a wonderful no, movie. Whether the film was good or not, I have no idea. And it was a... Uh, uh, I know what I tried was right, and I don't know if I did it right, but um, but the instinct was right, and that was what happened after the uh, the end came up mm -hmm. in those beautiful Technicolor movies. Most I love them, the Minnelli pictures, or uh, even the ones directed by Michael Curtiz and so many so many others, uh, George Cukor. And um, I tried to, at the same time, having this kind of a kind of a crazy dream of the old Hollywood. Uh, 1972, 73, I'm out there and I'm looking for the old sets and everything's being destroyed. Mm -hmm. MGM has gone down, they're selling everything, MGM closed up completely. Um, uh, and so it was a world that was dying in a way, or may have been dead already. Uh, we were these barbarians at the gates, or I speak for myself, I guess, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, um, and I tried to recreate the artifice of the theater, of the um, uh, lo uh, of the uh, studio film mm -hmm. uh, in New York. I always talk about the curbs in New York. We have a curb. The curb is like uh, six inches, maybe. So in the old Hollywood films, they always have a New York street, and the curb is like two feet high. <laughs> <laughs> Where like the hell? Kelly's jumping yeah, up and down in the rain. <laughs> what is that? I said, oh, it's supposed to be New York. Okay, we accept it. it's code. It's codified. But what if we really, what if we make a film and take uh, the, the, uh, an improvisatory um, uh, approach to the characters, uh, and a love story about two very creative people um, and what that does to a relationship uh, in terms of uh, uh, competition. I love that movie. To me, that's your follies. For me, it was a very difficult period because I was struggling through it. The actors were struggling mm -hmm. through it. We, we kept rewriting and reworking it. And, um, um, and so I never, uh, for me, all the movies I make remind me of a certain time. And uh, I don't really see them anymore, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't listen to Hamilton either. No, no. <laughs> yeah, but you do it every night. You're in it. I do it. You got all the fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, both, especially in, in Hamilton, you can see it that there's a um, there's a theme that's a very present theme in a lot of your films, Marty. I mean, I think uh, if you want to try to summarize many of your films in one sentence, they could be summarized as we had a, we had it really good, and then we got greedy and we fucked it up. Like that's, that's, that's right. So often. Jeez. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, thank you. Thank you. I'm literally going through the IMDb in my brain. No, I know. <laughs> You're so that's right. Scary. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh, that's good. And you so these are there are often stories about like I can't, I couldn't decide on the right word because I keep going back and forth between ambition and aspiration. And like flip, like you think about a character, like say the Henry Hill character uh, in Goodfellas, like uh, you know, and there are other examples of characters where maybe the word ambition feels more appropriate. But I see that as that's obviously a theme in Hamilton, or when you're thinking about Alexander Hamilton as well. And you said like he he blew himself up, yeah. 
by his pen. And in a way, he sort of did it in both senses of the word. You know, that he... Yeah, totally. And, and you know, it was, you know, for me, I think the secret sauce of the show is I fell in love with doing the research on it and learning about these people as men. And I'd always, they'd always just been kind of white guys on money and on mm -hmm. statues to me. Mm -hmm. And then you learn that, oh, Washington kind of fucked up and started the French and Indian War when he was Hamilton's age. Uh, <laughs> he was in a raid. He was supposed to broker a uh, peace treaty between uh, French and these Native Americans, and they, like, massacred each other, and his men got taken captive. So this is a guy who, you know, in contemporary terms, like, his career is over before it's begun right. in the military. Right. And so his obsession with legacy and posterity, and he's stiff like this because he's terrified of messing. Like, to understand Washington's just terrified of messing up. Mm -hmm. um, that was my way into mm -hmm. Washington. Um, and, and, and to a person figuring out, all right, what's the way into this guy so that I can, you know, because I don't know any other way of writing than just talking to myself until I, I feel like I understand what they would say and writing it down when it feels true. Mm -hmm. you know, you, I think we're all actors in that sense. Um, and you know, Aaron Burr, who left behind very little written work, um, and then I real, and which was frustrating. It's frustrating to figure out who this guy is. He didn't leave anything behind. Then you go, oh, the him not leaving behind is the thing. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. He doesn't want to be pinned down to an opinion. He doesn't want to, um, he, he, he shares everything with Hamilton. They're both orphans. They're both brilliant. Um, but he comes from this incredible legacy. His, pa his father was the president of Princeton. Um, his mother was this brilliant woman. His grandfather is Jonathan Edwards, who wrote Sinners in the Hands of, at right. the Hands of an Angry God. Right. Um, so he's got, he's just terrified of losing what he's been born with. Right. And Hamilton ain't got shit to lose. Um, uh, but same circumstances, but just comes from poverty and is like, well, w what's going to happen? Um, so finding that difference of temperament was sort of the key. Uh, to and do you, would you say that, would you, do you think the word aspiration or ambition fits Hamilton better? Um, well, gosh, it depends which of his friends you talk to, <laughs> um, uh -huh. I suppose. I think, I think in his head, I think aspiration is, is key. But, you know, there's also this this thread of martyrdom that goes through the whole thing. The first letter we have of Hamilton, um, he says, you know, I wish there was a, he concludes the letter by saying, I wish there was a war. Uh, he starts by saying, um, you know, I, he's a clerk in St. Croix. He has no way off the island. Um, and he says, he's writing to his friend Ned Stevens, and he says, you know, you may think I am, I am building castles in the air, um, and, but my ambition is prevalent. Mm -hmm. He actually says ambition, but my ambition is, is prevalent, and we have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. Basically, like, mm -hmm. if I don't stop, and get it, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but but yes, he was he was an ambitious guy. Um, but he also wrote poems about dying on the field and mm -hmm. glory, and that being a way out too. He had the same adolescent martyrdom fantasies that I think we all have. But he didn't have that same quite that that compulsion that so com so driven to succeed that he would sacrifice his principles or or in no. A way and that in we fact, he died indigent. I mean, he left his wife. I mean, that's the really sort of monstrous thing is, you know, he w he ha he literally invented the rules on how our financial system worked and did not get rich off it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and went to a duel and left his wife in debt. Congress set up a fund to pay for Eliza and her eight children um, uh, after he died. Yeah, we only have one on stage, but there are eight. <laughs> we figure if you want eight kids, see the sound of music. <laughs> um, we don't have time and we don't have money. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that's the... Um, so it's it he, in in a sense he's 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 too altruistic at the expense of his family mm -hmm. and his personal life. For you, Marty, I mean, do you think that um, it's so? I I tried to think of an example of one of your films where the character or characters who are striving and who are ambitious and don't meet either a grisly fate or or just kind of or 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 end up in this way that that Lamada is in in uh, you know it. Say, reciting his poetry well, in the nightclub, but do you, is that, where do you think that, that vision, do you well, drive that vision just from looking at America and its history and saying that's well, pretty I, much uh, the story uh, of America, uh, or? A number of, uh, a great deal of it comes from um, uh, my um, obsessive uh, readings and rereadings of uh, Bible and New Testament, and, uh, and then um, other religious literature, but uh, Again, uh, that uh, priest who uh, guided us 
uh, talked about values, mm -hmm. different sorts of values, and we had the toughest around us, really. We had a, it was a great, as they say, a great neighborhood in the sense that it was really a neighborhood, but you know, there was organized crime there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the heyday of it, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, they were the most powerful, and when they fell, they fell. Mm -hmm. And I'd feel that around me, around the kitchen table, my father would talk about so-and-so, and, -so and this and that happening, and uh, somebody overstepping a line. Mm -hmm. The fall was so, if they didn't get killed, was so shameful mm -hmm. that that fascinated me. The, where that line of the pride mm -hmm. takes over and ambition mm -hmm. uh, beyond aspiration. Mm -hmm. And then so in the projects I've done, I've always seemed to be uh, drawn to that, that story. And uh, maybe the, what's it, that the reach is uh, 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 overextends yeah, the grasping the that grasp. I'm able to get, but I don't know what else to do, reach out <laughs> there. And um, um, on, at the same time, the, um, if that's the case and everything does blow up, and I've seen it happen to a lot of people, um, and to myself a couple, number of times, mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> where, where is the values then in life? Where are the values? And it goes back again from what I, what I know, which is um, um, uh, today it's unfashionable to say, but spiritual matters. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the film I made in George Harrison, Living in the Material I World. I mean, so much. you know, what, what is it? What is it? And uh, um, so hence uh, silence. Is, is, uh, takes us back in that direction. Um, because inevitably, with this kind of thinking, like Wolf of Wall Street, there's never enough. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna blow up. Mm -hmm. When is enough? What do we need? What do we need to live? You know, if you're living in, I don't know, you, you, you become very big, like you make movies and stuff, you have three houses, mm -hmm. boats, cars, and planes, do you really need it? Mm -hmm. I mean, some people do. Others kill themselves trying to get it. Please. I mean, kill themselves spiritually. You saw the fragility, or you, uh, you experienced pretty early on how fragile oh. apparent great status. Oh, it's power. extraordinary what I saw. I, I mean, you, for me, it, was, it impressed me. Let me put it that way. Will you, will you tell a story that I, you told me um, the first time I met you about oh. uh, how, well, like your family, you, the, the, the um, mafia or organized crime activity was around you, but you were part of it. But you told, you told me about this when you kind of had to face it yourself for the first time, I think it was you were shooting Mean Streets, there was like a church you wanted to shoot in or a building you needed or? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well we were shooting in, yeah, well this is, a number of the people that my father was aligned, in other words not aligned with, but not being part of a, a crime families or anything like that. If you wanted to get anything done, you had to deal with them. And some were more reasonable than others and others were more, it was all through relations and friends of friends and, and that sort of thing. Um, and um, I, I was going to shoot in one building, Main Streets, and uh, you know uh, he had to go talk to one guy. And he said, "I wish it wasn't this guy." I said, "Well," you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know he went in and said, "Look, don't charge the kid a lot of money for the, the building." You know, and the guy said, "Not, nah, that's it, three hundred dollars." You know, to shoot in the building. And he said, "Come on, it's a kid from the neighborhood." He said, well, "He's going to remember us. He makes it three hundred dollars." <laughs> And then, of course, the San Gennaro Festival Committee. Oh. Mm -hmm. 5,000. Wow. I didn't have it. And Francis Coppola gave it to me. Uh -huh. And then as soon as the picture was finished, it came back. <laughs> Right? That's the part. <laughs> yeah. You want it? And also, they were from Mulberry Street. They were Neapolitan. I'm going to go to this guy from, like, forget it. And what is he going to, he's going to make, like, he's going to be a success, stuff like that. And, and what about us? And so $5,000 went to the saint. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then soon John Taplin gave them, Francis the money right back as soon as we sold the picture. Wow. <laughs> but Francis gave me, you know. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing, right? That's why it gets me now. Everybody shoots. Well, it's all gone now. But even mm -hmm. right after that, everybody came. The guy, I was down there. I gave, I was with uh, Dean Tubalaris and a number of other people. And I took them around. And they got locations for The Godfather from there. Oh, and wow. I, I, with the oil, the olive oil factory and uh -huh. uh, the interior of St. Patrick's. Uh, uh, now a basilica, mm -hmm. St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, which was the uh, my church, and you know we shot in the, the graveyard outside, mm -hmm. but um, they shot in the interior, the baptism scene at the end of Godfather is mm -hmm. shot in there, and that's when they realized they can open up to the outside world and make some profit, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then the whole neighborhood really kind of changed mm -hmm. in a way. I just talking to Lynn or listening to Lynn recount some of the things that. Um, you had gone through just in the past few days while we were waiting, so much of the history that you have learned in the course of working on Hamilton is so present for you, I can tell, as you're sort of moving through New York City now, and you're moving, and 
um, when you arrived here tonight, Marty, you, you were just remembering what the Bowery, like here we are in the Bowery and he grew up a few blocks away and he's saying like, I can't believe this is the Bowery and this is what the Bowery is like. And, and so, you know, if you are, if you're either were here or you have done your homework or you've done the reading, you realize that as you're moving through New York City, you're just moving through all these layers of history, so many different kinds of history. Is it, do you think, um, do you think, I mean, it, is that, before you started doing research, Lynn, for, for Hamilton, were you, were you already sort of always wondering like what happened in this street corner or, no. or yeah, it was kind of a, yeah. No, it really was, I mean, it, it opened me up to everything and, the, and, and you, you described it exactly right. We are, we are sitting 10 layers above Hamilton's New York. Mm -hmm. um, and to know that um, the Morris Jamel Mansion, um, which was part of, th was three important parts of revolutionary history. It was Washington's headquarters um, when they were fleeing from the British uh, in that first escape. It was the site of their first cabinet dinner, so that's Hamilton and Jefferson and Knox and Washington sitting around that dinner table. And then decades later, Aaron Burr marries Eli the widow Eliza Jumel, um, lives there for a year, he's got a bedroom still in that house, takes all her money and leaves. Um, <laughs> Aaron Burr, he's really a character. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's, and that house is on 162nd Street in Washington Heights. My last show was um, set in Washington Heights, but all Dominican and Latino and sort of the, what I grew up in and sort of experiencing um, the top of Manhattan as a tiny Latin American country where mm -hmm. everyone is from everywhere and you can speak Spanish and totally be understood. Um, and that was my experience growing up uh, on 200th Street. Um, so to realize that, oh, like the subjects I'm writing about were just, it's exactly the same 11 miles, mm -hmm. um, which is so extraordinary. You know, which is so extraordinary about Gangs of New York. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, Union Square, um, mm -hmm. and it's dirt instead of concrete, mm -hmm. um, but it's the same place, and we're just standing a few piles on top of it. Marty, when did your consciousness of New York City, that the, of those underlayers first, like, how, what was your, was it reading a book like Gangs of New York? No, 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 uh, it was, uh, uh, real, real quick, I'll try to give a, uh, a sense of it. My my parents were born on on Elizabeth Street in 241 and 232, respectively, in the buildings in 1912 and 1913. So when they uh, one of each 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 had eight or nine uh, brothers and sisters, they were all living together, etc. In their apartment. So when they got married in 1933, the idea was to get out of the neighborhood, and they went. Uh, they eventually um, they worked in the garment district. Eventually got to Sunnyside, Queens, mm -hmm. and then moved to Corona, mm -hmm. Queens, and that's where I was born, Flushing. And for those first five or six years, I was in Corona. I didn't know the rest of the world. It was like they had trees and everything. It was mm -hmm. fantastic. It was the forest. Uh, what was that? The, where they, the, the, the World Fair is, the World's yeah. Fair. That, that far forest hills, yeah. And there was hills. They were like, you know. And um, it was amazing. I just loved it. And then my father got into a, a fight with the landlord, and um, uh, we had to move out. Mm. And he, we moved back to Elizabeth Street, where... He was born and she was born, and we got an apartment at 253 Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And I literally looked out the window, and I saw kids running in the streets with garbage pails and guys fighting and people chasing rats and um, <laughs> people laughing, singing. It was, it, was, it was being thrown into another world. Um, and so I, uh, and then also I was sent to a, uh, the, the St. Saint, Saint Patrick's um, School uh, run by the Sisters of uh, Mercy. But that, but that's so key that you you came to your neighborhood as an observer. So you're outside yes, it. Already. Yeah, and I was I was supposed not to run or play or fight with anybody. But I was gonna get killed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna get killed, and I did. But for a long time, after a while, it was fine. But but go to the school. The nuns are teaching us, and it was really tough. And I began. I was fascinated by the wall around St. Patrick's Old Cathedral. It kind of bends a little bit, mm. and I was told that years ago there were these people who had to defend the church against these groups who didn't want them there. And this is the wall that they were all behind with guns and that sort of thing. And then I saw, we, we, we used to play hide and seek in that graveyard. And it's still there, of course. And we would look at the names on the gravestones and they were not Italian and they were not Irish. Um, uh, they were Spanish, mainly. And um, also Toussaint, I think the first American saint. Toussaint, uh -huh. He's, he was buried there. They took his, they moved his body now, but he was buried there. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, I, it, it, there was a, there was a sense of history in on the in the wall and in the in mm -hmm. the church itself, which was built in I think eighteen ten or eighteen o two, 
and the cobblestones because my father would tell me of what he used to hear when he was a kid about these wild gangs that were there and mm. these group called, there was a myth, I think to this day it was mythological really, the group called the 40 Thieves. Uh, and they said, well, they were the worst. And, mm. they, and there was always, a, there was always a, a thing in the street, the 40 Thieves are coming. Well, <laughs> <running>. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> it was really, like, where were they? They, they became, became like a gang, would, would take on another, the name of a previous gang, etc. Uh, and all that was really... I knew that there were stories there. There were extraordinary stories, especially off that Sammy's Bowery Follies, the, uh, the, 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 what was left over from the 1890s of the Bowery, uh, Chuck Connors and all those, uh, all those stories with uh, Monk Eastman mm -hmm. and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, and I wanted to know further what was there earlier. And um, I, one day I just found this book called Gangs of New York. And uh, it, it dealt with a great deal of the folklore uh, whether it's uh, true or not true, uh, uh, I, I, I don't. I don't know. I think after after the Civil War, I think the downtown section of New York was written about in the papers. Uh, but prior to that, I think they just cut it off, just let it go. You know, um, uh, by the end by the end of the draft riots, particularly, was so awful. Um, but in any event, it all seemed to kind of um, there was a lot of history and there was a lot of uh, stories and. Um, I wanted to know who they were, mm -hmm. and who we are. Mm -hmm. and what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, what? Did, how did they make this work? This supposed democracy at Tammany Hall? What the hell was that? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that didn't seem to have. Uh, wasn't very fair, was it? Um, <laughs> and the Irish community that came in, the gangs in New York, and they were fighting the, amongst themselves in the streets with the nativists. And then eventually, the Italians get there, and everybody's Irish. Yeah. And the police, the government, uh, the mm -hmm. city government. And they try to work under the Irish. And eventually, I think by 1940s it, it, or late 30s, it kind of settled in. Mm -hmm. um, there's a new book, I think, called Un, uh, Unholy Union, I think it is, or mm. un, uh, about the uh, Italians and the Irish. Uh, oh, right. Doing, yeah, yeah. I, I may get the title wrong, sorry. It sounds right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not unholy, but uneasy, I think. Uh -huh. uh, but in any event, it was, you know, the first, they were the first immigrants, so they had to do something. And they got into, um, they were smart, got into the police force and... And, and the government, and so uh, uh, along with that, with the um, Catholic Church, the Irish running the church here. So it was a very difficult thing for the uh, uh, Italians who came over who didn't speak English. And that automatically uh, puts you apart from it. But in any, anyway, I just wanted to know who the hell we were. Um, well, here on the top layer, um, for the moment, uh, I've come to the end of my questions, but I think um, there's probably a few people here tonight that might wanna ask a question. So um, do we, are we gonna just, it's a small room, we can hear you, or we have a microphone too, so there we go. It's been a fascinating conversation about the impact of history, music, art, New York neighborhoods on your work, and I'd like to see if we could extend that just another element further to the visual arts and painting, and perhaps as a jumping off point, uh, what seems to be the influence of Caravaggio and other paintings of that ilk on Mr. Scorsese's work. <laughs> Caravaggio's influence in Marty's work? Uh, yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well do, you, do you feel, do you have a connection to either a particular visual artist or, or a particular because form of visual art form? Absolutely. Really well, well, the thing that, that is um, it's true, and you probably feel this a little bit in Hamilton as well, is I don't write imagining what things are going to look like on stage. I write them filmically. Um, it's actually like a use slow motion. They're like vignettes. Everywhere. Yeah, like we do montages. slow motion, and one verse of a song will start in one year, and then the next verse is three years later. Because in my head, I've just smash cut to three years later. Um, I am not picturing how it's going to work on stage, and that makes uh, for interesting challenges for Tommy Kale, our incredible director, <laughs> um, who has literally seventy scene settings in Hamilton, um, and two turntables to help reconcile them. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, you know, when I'm writing Yorktown, I'm not picturing them on stage. I'm picturing them in Yorktown. Singing, saying these things. Um, so um, all this to say that I, I actually think very visually in terms of when, when I'm writing these songs, and, and particularly with Hamilton, where we're trying to you know, get this man's life down in two hours and 45 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm smash cutting, and I'm using dissolves, and, yeah, mm, of course. Yeah, and rewinding, and yeah. Uh, in, in terms of the, the films I've made over the years, I, I, I find that I, I feel more comfortable in urban settings, obviously, and um, my... Uh, uh, I yearn for uh, films uh, in the outdoors. 
um, when I was a kid, I, I, I was, uh, particularly because of the asthma and all this sort of thing, I, they took me to see a lot of westerns and, uh, you know, extraordinary expanses and color and that sort of thing, with these extraordinary characters. And so uh, I've only done a few films that uh, took me um, uh, outdoors. The, the latest one, um, uh, Silence, uh, uh, Rodrigo Prieto shot it, and uh, Rodrigo, well, we got, <laughs> we got into, you know, basically the first half of the picture is all outdoors. Uh, but I mean outdoors. I mean up on mountains. And uh, uh, I had design shots. I had design editing sequences. Uh, by the time, it's a long story, but by the time we got up there with cameras and that sort of thing, and this was a smaller crew, but uh, uh, with the cranes, I'd look around and, well, uh, we throw everything right out because mm -hmm. the location itself dictated what it is, and move the actors from here to here, if they can, you know, uh, between, there were some earthquakes, there were, uh, it was a very rough shoot. Um, there was mud. There's that, there's that great there Kurosawa mud? story where, they, where someone asks him, why did you frame the shot just so? And he said, well, if you turn to the left, there's like a store there. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, if you turn to the right, there's like oh, a no. train station, it takes place in feudal Japan. So. What, was, what was interesting, <laughs> was that's it, why it's yeah. framed that way. What was interesting is that this, we didn't see any of that. This was, it demanded, it's, there was some, sometimes mist would come up. I'd turn around, everybody was gone. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we couldn't walk because we, everything was dangerous, and, and so and so it was an extraordinary thing. When we got into the farmers' huts, for example, uh, and the the, the 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 villagers were in this case in 1640 in, in Japan outside of uh, Nagasaki in these small villages, they were so poor they didn't even have tatami mats, you know. So they had one lamp, one oil lamp. Now the lighting. So, <laughs> <laughs> you can't say Nanook, can yeah, we no, bring no, in no. some lyrics? <laughs> 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 like, well, we, we used a film for most of the picture, but um, we did a lot of tests and ultimately used the Alexa digital. And that one light, uh, the, obviously the, the name that comes to mind is Caravaggio, mm. because that's the lighting. That's the lighting he, he, he around him at that time. Mm. And that's how people, and, um, it was quite extraordinary now, uh, uh, finding that. Um, we tried it also in Last Temptation, and uh, 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 Hugo is different, the 3D film. That was somewhat different with, uh, with that, but uh, the sense of the light sources really started to dictate, and um, paintings, drawings, and that sort of thing. Did you look at some Japanese paintings or woodcuts or anything of the period to help? Yes, but, oh, for many years, and um, ultimately it doesn't really, you can't, how can, uh, I'm a Westerner, and the main characters, so to speak, are Westerners. They're from Portugal, the two Jesuits. is Andrew Garfield and uh, Adam Driver. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Liam Neeson plays uh, Father Ferrara, real character from uh, Jesuit. Um, the Japanese actors are remarkable. Um, Issei Ogata, who played the emperor in a film by Sukharov called The Sun, mm -hmm. if you've ever seen that. Uh, and oh, Shinya Tsukamoto is a great um, sort of avant-garde horror film director. <laughs> Quite wild. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in any event, um, uh, we, uh, and as I say, half the picture was in Japanese. So wow. that was another issue. Had to, it was a lot of it. So the, um, the, the, part, of, part of what we did was the, silk, the paintings on screens. Oh. And we staged things accordingly, uh, particularly the paintings in, of um, the, the Dutch at the Dejima which was their market, sort of like a little island they built in right. outside of Naga Nagasaki Bay. Um, they just wanted to keep them there. You couldn't get on, you couldn't get off. That's it. There's Once a you're great on there, David that's Mitchell it. novel. Uh, hmm? What's that David Mitchell novel that's set? Oh, yeah, the one about the, um, uh, um, yes. Uh, yeah, what's it called? The Dutch oh, the, name? The Thousand Autumns of Yes, Dick. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we, well, you know, so all of that, and, and uh, we, we literally staged um, scenes uh, with the same canopy of blue and white stripes, mm. uh, the same thing. Oh. Um, um, uh, I found uh, that we really couldn't rely on uh, uh, other screen paintings uh, at that point. There was very, very little draw drawings and mm -hmm. woodcuts. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and it really became a matter of, um, um, as I say, the land itself. Mm -hmm. The land itself and the feeling you had there with the, on the tops of these mountains. That was quite extraordinary. I mean, once we got up there, you couldn't get down anyway. So. Mm -hmm. So that, <laughs> no, you couldn't go down, forget it. So, so you'd gonna, say you gotta shoot it and you're gonna shoot with this, that's it. You're gonna be and going the weather, whatever soon. the weather was, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it didn't sound like it. Um, maybe I see a hand there. Oh. So I saw Hamilton at the Wesleyan 
benefit. And I was sitting with a lot of college students. And one of the things that really struck me is, and you know, they were, besides the music, and I mean, Hamilton is great. But there was also an, an element of kind of bro culture. And you like depicted these guys like a bunch of like bros, like guys. It would have been even worse if I'd gotten Ben Franklin in there. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So, <laughs> Google so, Ben Franklin's on the virtues of dating older women. If you want to see like bro culture in its colonial infancy, <laughs> he writes his essay on virtue of, of dating older women. He says, first of all, you're not going to get him pregnant. <laughs> Second of all, like, and it's kind of like funny and it's also kind of gross. <laughs> and, then the, and the last joke is, and lastly, they are so grateful. Oh. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right? Ew. <laughs> ben Franklin. <laughs> Stick to a stitch in time saves nine. <laughs> um, but, but you know, it's, I'm, I'm taking my lead from the historical documents of that time. There's a letter from Hamilton to Lawrence where he says, and Hamilton and Lawrence probably had, um, had an affair themselves. Their letters are just as intimate as Hamilton and, and Angelica's. Um, but Hamilton says, Lawrence, I'm going to need you to find me a wife. Uh, she needs to be good looking, but not so good looking that I have to worry about it. Um, she said, it does not matter what political persuasion she is, I will convince her to my own. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, this is like, I sound like a 21st century bro when I say yeah. that. I mean, there, so there is, there is a, a casual sexism um, that exists uh, among these men, um, which is also why it, we found it very important to, to write the Schuyler sisters into the narrative in a very real and definitive way, because Angelica Schuyler was every bit every bit the intellectual equal um, of these men and corresponded with Jefferson um, and, and was desperate for news of the colony. She married a banker in London, um, but was desperate to know what was going on because she couldn't participate in the way that these men did. Um, and so it was important for me to dimensionalize her and Eliza and her extraordinary life um, um, as, as sort of a counterweight to what I was reading in these historical documents. Right. Cool, thanks. Maybe one last question. I don't know, how are we for time? One last, okay, yeah. Um, I was wondering, it sounds like for, for, for both of these projects that you guys are working on, and I'm sure for you too, Michael, that um, these are very personal visions that you first get. I mean, when you're talking about seeing these people at Yorktown, what is collaboration like after that? How do you, who do you choose to work with and, and how do you figure out whose vision to go with after That's that? That's the perfect question to end on because we both work in mediums where it's not one art form, it's 20 art forms smashed together. Um, so I know what I bring into the room is the music and lyrics and I'm very happy and proud to do that. And I know that, you know, I, I, I had the good fortune of working with most of uh, the, our creative team on Hamilton on my last show in the Heights. So there's a shorthand there that exists that I'm sure you have with your editor um, where I'm going to bring in the song and they're going to throw 20 ideas into the pot and and the, the uh, virtue of a strong director like a Kale and a Scorsese is that the best, if you're really running the room right, the best idea wins. Um, the best idea in the room wins and, and we're all marching in the same direction making the same thing and it's really the key to the whole thing. You have all seen movies undone by that one choice where you're like, why didn't anyone say don't do that? Mm -hmm. um, or, mm -hmm. and it can be, you know, I have seen beautiful musicals with ugly sets that constantly took me out. Like, it just takes one element to pull you out to really make the magic work. These 20 art forms all have to be marching in the same direction towards the same thing. So that's actually the key to the process. And it's, and you know, I'm in awe of what you do, Michael, because I, to me, the fun is in getting to bring it in and be like, all right, now how can we make this better? I wrote this. Um, and and to, to sit alone with it, you direct the whole thing. Um, yes, exactly. And you create the picture for us in yeah. your heads, and that's... that's right far lonelier work and, and than I could do. And I'm such an asshole to have to work for, too. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you... Uh, it's a, yeah. Collaboration a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, the collaboration, yes. I mean, that's the key thing, and, and especially in, you know, with uh, cinematographer, the actors. It really, uh, I've I found over the years, uh, it, the casting is, is 85 to 90% of it. Right. And uh, I would have been lucky to... Uh, it's the old story, but I found... We stumbled into a relationship, Robert De Niro and I, and um, where we kind of felt the same way about certain things. We also knew each other because he used to sort of hang out, so to speak, mm -hmm. in uh, on, on uh, uh, in my old neighborhood when he was about 16 or 17. I remember him, 
Uh, so he knows the people. He knows. The only one who really knows where it came from now and um, understands it. Uh, and then later in life, um, uh, to uh, find another uh, collaborator like Leo DiCaprio, uh, who's uh, I'm 30 years older, but um, has same similar instincts and, and um, same fearlessness in a way. And so uh, that's the thing. It's really, it's really for me, obviously the story and the scripting, but um, uh, in certain cases, we work with the writer and the actors. In many cases, like Departed, for example, or uh, and when you find uh, that we, shorthand, you don't want to let it go. No, 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 of course not. And the thing about it was constant reworking, constant reworking. And one, I think it was Departed, where finally at one point I kept we kept rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, and the actors and this, and we put it. I put uh, Bill Monahan in a uh, in Vera Farmiga off somewhere. I said, "Come back with this and that," and they come back, and we change it again. Um, and finally, uh, my my continuity person sitting there and says, here comes another another scene. Where do you want to put this? I said, put it in the middle with everything else. <laughs> because at some point, I'm going to figure out what the middle is. <laughs> and that was me and Thelma mm -hmm. hacking away, changing it. And they said, that damn storyline, you know, we had to stay to the plot. But the thing about it was really the cinematographer, the actors, the writers, and um, ultimately my editor and my sound crew. My sound crew. Um, and uh, I've been very lucky to have people who were, um, particularly my editor, Thelma, who's, uh, 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 mm, how should I put it? There's a lot, of, a lot of difficulty when a film is finally presented to the uh, uh, studios or mm -hmm. the financiers. And mm -hmm. uh, she remains very strong with, uh, and that sort of thing keeps me, keeps me uh, level that way. Uh, because it's always a, it's a constant battle in a war. It doesn't matter who you are, really, you know. And so um, uh, that's the key. That's the key, the collaboration. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You. Thank you. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much.